Well, a very good morning to you all and a warm welcome to a warm day in Cape Town. It's uh, wonderful to be able to gather on this day after Christmas. And as I jokingly said to the eight o'clock, uh, 20 people at the eight o'clock service this morning, uh, it's good to see the faithful remnant uh, after the fullness of our Christmas worship and services. But I uh, do welcome you to this time and uh, thankful to the team that is helping today. And um, so a big thanks to uh, Rob, who's behind the scenes with uh, uh, Zoom, uh, to Freya, who will be leading us in the liturgy, and Nick, who will be our responder, as well as to um, uh, Beryl and Edgar for doing our scripture readings this morning. We've uh, heard this morning the incredibly sad news of Archbishop uh, Desmond's passing. And uh, I'd like to just begin the service by reading the announcement from Archbishop Tabu, uh, and then just holding a moment of quiet. Archbishop Tabu writes, it is with great sadness that I have to announce that our dearly beloved Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town and the 1984 Nobel Peace Laureate, Desmond Mpilo Tutu died a short while ago at the age of 90. On behalf of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, the whole and the whole faith community. And I make bold to say on behalf of millions across South Africa, Africa and the world, I extend our deepest condolences to his wife, uh, Normalizo Lea, to his son Trevor Tamsankwa, and to his daughters Tandeka Ntombi, Nontombi and Mpo and all their families. While we mourn his passing as Christians and people of faith, we must also celebrate the life of a deeply spiritual person whose alpha and omega, his starting point and his ending point was his relationship with our creator. He took God, God's purposes and God's creation deadly seriously. Prayer, the scriptures and his ministry to the people of God entrusted to his care were at the heart of his life. He believed totally that each one of us is made in the image of God and ought to be treated as such by others. This belief was not reached through the cerebral contemplation. It arose from his faith and was held with a deeply felt passion. He wanted every human being on earth to experience the freedom, the peace and the joy that all of us could enjoy if we truly respected one another as people created in the image of God. Because he believed this and because he worshiped God, he feared no one. He named wrong wherever he saw it and by whomever it was committed. He challenged the systems that demeaned humanity. He could unleash a righteous anger on those, especially the powerful, who inflicted suffering upon those the Bible calls the least of these, my brothers and sisters. And when the perpetrators of evil experienced a true change of heart, he followed the example of his Lord and was willing to forgive. Desmond Tutu's legacy is moral strength, moral courage, and clarity. He felt with the people. In public and alone, he cried because he felt people's pain. And he laughed. No, not just laughed. He cackled with delight when he shared their joy. In accordance with his instructions, the church will plan his funeral and other memorial services with the generous support of the South African government and the city of Cape Town. Details of these events will be held under South African COVID regulations and will be announced later. In the meantime, let us prayerfully remember him by the epitaph he once chose for himself. He laughed, he cried, he loved. In the words of the prayer which his mentor and friend Archbishop Trevor Huddleston first composed, and he then adapted as he extended his ministry from South Africa to the world. God bless the world. God our children, guide our leaders, and give us peace for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. We keep a moment of silence. May Desmond Mpilo Tutu rest in peace and rise in glory.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Praise the Lord. Praise God, you servants of the Lord. Blessed be God, creator, redeemer, and spirit of truth. Blessed be God's name now and forever. Let us joyfully proclaim together. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus, you are mighty God and Prince of Peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Son of God and Son of Mary. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Word made flesh and splendor of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And now in a moment of silence, let us call to mind and then confess our sins, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with our neighbor. And so we confess together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. And so, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you. Pardon your sins and set you free from them. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you wonderfully created us in your own image and yet more wonderfully restored us. As Jesus Christ came to share our humanity, so we may share the life of his divinity, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Colossians 3. A reading from Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, mm -hmm. humility, meekness, and patience. Be with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> We'll say together now Psalm 148. I'll begin if you could please respond with the verses in bold. Alleluia. Praise God from the heavens. Sing praise in the heights. Praise God, all you angels. Sing praise, all the heavenly host. Praise God, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise God, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of God, by whose command they were created. God made them stand fast forever and ever, and gave them a law which shall not pass away. Praise God from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind doing God's will mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged birds, sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, leaders and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together. Let them praise your name, O God, for your name only is exalted, your splendors over earth and heaven. You have raised up strength for your people and praise for all your loyal servants, the children of Israel, a people who are near you. Alleluia. Let us pray. O oh, glorious God, the whole creation proclaims your marvelous work. Increase in us a capacity to wonder and delight in it, that heaven's praise may echo in our hearts and our lives be spent as good stewards of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glory to God, source of all being, eternal Son and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to Luke. Chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Glory to Christ our Savior. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. And his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at the understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Today in our collect, 
we prayed the words, um, well, we acknowledge that um, we are wonderfully, uh, that God has wonderfully created us in his own image um, and yet more wonderfully restored us. But we went on to pray that as Jesus came to share our humanity, so we may share the life of his divinity. And so that humanity in one hand, divinity in the other hand. We spent a lot of time over Christmas uh, focusing on Jesus or God's humanity in Jesus. Um, we refer to this time as the incarnation of God into our midst, uh, God coming to be part of human life, to experience human life. And we've spent some time just really worshiping God for that incredible gift that God gives to our world. Bishop Jeff preached yesterday at eight o'clock and just spoke to us about the, the amazing nature of, of creation in which we live, uh, the hugeness of the universe that, or multiverse that we're part of and, and, and the insignificance of our planet within that and, and clearly our insignificance as human beings in the midst of all of that. Um, and yet God chooses to come in Jesus to be part of this planet's life, uh, to be part of humanity's experience. Today's reading from the gospel touches on something of just the human nature of Jesus as a child, as a young, as a young, as a growing boy, and um, wonderful sense of, of just family and, and confusion that comes with that. Uh, the family having been up down from Nazareth to, to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, and of course, traveling in a large family group. Uh, expecting that, well, the children would have just moved between families, uncle and aunt here, a few cousins there. Um, it's not surprising it took them a few days to recognize that Jesus was missing. Um, and when you consider Nazareth's only about 150 kilometers from Jerusalem, um, they must have virtually been in Nazareth before they realized that he was missing. And um, eventually they go back to find him and find him in the temple. Um, and uh, when they ask him, you know, why he wasn't he with everyone, um, he shares that this is where he needs to be. This is his father's house. Uh, and um, just on a practical level, at our crib service on, uh, on Friday evening, uh, we had a couple of families, three families, four families. Uh, and the one family, there was a 14-year-old, there was an 11-year-old, and there was a four-year-old. And, of course, the 14-year-old has reached that point where he is... Uh, a, a young teenager um, feeling his, his adultness coming in and, and you could see his sense of not wanting to necessarily fully interact um, with the, the more child focused service, although he very kindly took a figurine and helped me put that in the, in, in the crib. But, but that was the 14 year old. Um, then there was an 11 year old who, um, well, let me go to the four year old first. Uh, I, I want to say that if you ever want to know what's happening in anybody's family life, just ask a four-year-old. Uh, she was really cute, wonderfully wanting to share all sorts of information, relevant, irrelevant, um, about what we were doing. But the 11-year-old, and this is my point, was, was actually really, um, there, was a, there was a growing level of, of interest in life. And as I asked questions, he was the one who just happily put his hand up um, gave responses, um, and, and there's something about 11 going on 12 that one's beginning to uh, interact with life at a deeper level and beginning to ask questions and, and wanting to understand. Um, and just I was struck with, with just his interaction at the crib service how, uh, and, and then today's gospel reading that, that really defined Jesus in the temple just showed, showed there's obviously big implications to it, but it just showed that that 11, 12-year-old desire to, to really begin to, to understand what's happening. Um, and Luke gives us this wonderful insight into, into Jesus really beginning to say, you know, who am I? What is God's call on my life? What, what, this, what is this all about? Um, and meeting with the teachers of the law, meeting with those who, who understood something of the, the traditions and the spirituality of Judaism. And, and Jesus drawing on that as, as, a, as a growing boy. And so just a, a wonderful picture there, uh, beyond all the other theology we can pull from that, of just this, this humanity that we see in Jesus' life at that point. But of course, the creed takes us 
um, beyond just Jesus becoming human. It speaks about um, Jesus or God becoming human, God, God coming into our lives to share our humanity so that we may share the life of his divinity. Now, the question, of course, is what, what does that mean? What does that look like? What is it all about? And uh, for me this morning, I think the, the key comes in with our reading from Colossians. Uh, chapter 3 obviously doesn't start at verse 12, where we entered, entered the narrative. It starts back at verse 1. Um, and of course, the book as a whole is important to hold with this. But chapter 3 in the NRSV is headed a new life in Christ. And, and what Paul is really grappling with in this, in this chapter is what does it mean to immerse ourselves in the divinity of God? What does it mean to enter into relationship with God? Um, and, and what does it mean for, for us in just the, the practicalities of daily living? And um, so if we go back to, to an earlier part in the chapter, back, back to verse 5 and 8, um, Paul reflects on, on kind of the brokenness of what it is to be human. And you and I know how easy it is for human beings for us to just enter into that negative space. And Paul is saying, if we want to experience the divinity of God, we need to take these things and we need to put them behind us. We need to walk away from them. And so he says, put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly. Um, Now, I don't think Paul here is negating our humanity. He's talking about those things that, that become destructive to human life and relationship. Put to death whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desires, uh, the, and greed, uh, which is, in brackets says, uh, which is idolatry. Um, and Paul goes on in three verses later, verse 8, to say, but now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Paul highlighting all that is clearly not divine <laughs> about our humanness, um, and yet often is so interwoven into the way we relate and to the brokenness we experience as human beings. Verse 12, Paul is shifting into saying, now that this is what it means to be in relation. This is the practical implication of what it is to be in relationship with God. And in terms of this Sunday and, and our Christmas journey, this is what sharing Um, in in God's divinity is all about. This is what it looks like. Um, And he starts with those incredible words, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. What does it mean to be chosen? What does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be loved? To be chosen, it reflects, and if we we look back at our Christmas story, if you go back as far as uh, Gabriel's annunciation to Mary about the fact that she will bear the Christ child, Um, He says to her, you are truly favored by God. To be favored is another way of saying you are chosen. And that theme for me has come through our Christmas services. That actually not only was Mary favored, but, but God favors humanity. And as we seek to enter into relationship with God, into divinity, so we need to acknowledge that we too are favored. And that favor is defined in terms of holiness and being beloved. And again, holy uh, in this context is to be like God. Uh, Another definition of being holy is um, to be different as God is different. And um, again, getting our minds around what that may mean and look like is may, may be more complicated. But to be different as God is different is what Paul is saying here. Put these things that are destructive aside and embrace that which reflects the nature of God. Seek to live that out. Be conscious about putting those negative things aside. Be conscious about embracing what is good and know that you're beloved. And that really is the nature of the Christmas story, a reminder that God so loved the world that he sent his son, um, that God became incarnate, that God embraced our experience of life. Paul, having said these things, of course, goes on to say, In order to live out this, your chosen nature, in order to live out your holiness and being beloved, clothe yourselves. And he mentions five things. He says, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, 
with meekness, with patience. Now, again, those are words. And what is not helpful about life <laughs> is that language uh, changes or words change meaning over time. And so words, when, um, when Paul wrote them, when they were translated into English, meant something. But in fact, in kind of common awareness or common usage, some of these words actually mean something different from what I think Paul purposed them to have. Um, so a word like compassion, um, so I just need to find another space in my laptop, there we go. Um, a word like compassion uh, could be described or should be described in the faith space as compassion is a deep empathy with one another. Now, the difference between, for me, compassion and sympathy, sorry, between empathy and sympathy is sympathy is kind of patting you on the back and saying, I really feel sorry for you. Um, but, you know, please know that, that I feel sorry, but, you know, carry on with your life. I'm going to carry on with mine. Empathy, which is at the heart of compassion, is actually saying, help me to understand what you're experiencing. Help me understand so that I can walk beside you. And, and be part of this journey with you. Allow me into your shoes, allow me into your perspective. That's what compassion is about, really seeking out that deep empathy. And again, it reflects the nature of God coming into our world. It's a compassionate act. God wants to come and be part of our reality. And so to clothe ourselves with compassion is to see, seek to be part of the, the reality of each other's lives and to do that meaningfully and deeply. We then move on to kindness. Um, and kindness, I think, is not a difficult word. It, kindness means kindness. It means being gentle. It means being caring. Uh, it means just not being harsh, dictatorial, uh, etc. It really means reaching out in, in a very full way to one another. Then we hear the word humility. And humility is one of those words that I think has changed its meaning over time. Uh, one of the interesting things which I happened to do was just go and uh, Google a definition for humility. And I'm not sure Google always comes up with particularly good definitions, uh, but it does tell us what is kind of just socially floating out there, what's the kind of common understanding. And the definition that Google came up with is that humility is the quality of having a modest or low view of one's importance. Now hold that against the fact that we are chosen, we are beloved, we are called to be holy. Um, humility here is suggesting that actually it's to deny that, it's to say I'm not important, I'm irrelevant. Uh, that's the kind of common understanding of humility at this point uh, in, in, our, in our common culture. Um, but I would suggest that in terms of our faith, that a slightly different um, definition would be useful. And, and that would be that humility is the quality of listening, respecting, engaging, and honoring one another. Let me read that to you again. Humility is the quality of listening, respecting, engaging, and honoring one another. Another word, that we may want to replace that with would be to be graceful. Grace is this nature of humility, one that really does take other people into account and say, I really want to hear, I want to hear from you. Um, I, I respect who you are as a fellow human being. I respect who you are, someone who similarly to me carries the image of God. Um, and in terms of just remembering Archbishop Desmond, Tila, uh, Desmond um, Tutu, Pilu Tutu this morning, um, he was a man who was truly humble on this level, um, willing to engage, uh, willing to honor the other person. You can see the difference between the kind of common definition and one that speaks to the depth of what Paul is calling us to in the Colossians reading today. And then, of course, another word that comes up, which is meekness. Um, and I don't know what you hear when you hear that word. Um, the similarity that it has to weakness um, in terms of just the, the, the audible nature of it um, has always made meekness difficult for me because I, I hear weakness, although that's not what the word means. But again, if we, if we Google that, 
uh, one of the, the definitions that comes up is it says that meekness is the fact or condition of being meek. Okay, And that sometimes definitions really don't help in that way. But it goes on to say it is submissiveness. Now, again, and I'm not going to take you to a definition of submissiveness. Um, it's used often in, in Paul's writing. Um, and, and again, when you link that into meekness uh, with a kind of social, uh, with a kind of understanding of our social environment today, meekness kind of says it's all about just throwing yourself down on the ground and saying to people, please use me as a doormat, wipe your feet on me, walk over me. Um, that's the kind of sense that, that comes out through this Google definition. But again, I would suggest um, that Paul, in referring to this, uh, has different purpose in the meaning here. And I would suggest in terms of faith and life and embracing our divinity, meekness is the dialing down of personality in cases where others need space to express themselves. Meekness is the dialing down of personality in cases where others need space to express themselves. Meekness seeks to not trample on others, but to help them up and along. And so, yeah, a wonderful sense of wholeness to that word meekness in that context. It's about recognizing that I am or you are, we're, we're big people. Um, we can be quite self-referencing a lot of the time. Um, we can be all that we are. And to actually ourselves choose in certain contexts to quieten our own voices, to quieten our own personalities. Why? To allow the voices of others to be raised. Um, and and to, to take that, to allow that space to be one in which it's not just me being heard, but it is really acknowledging one another. Um, and uh, if you've ever been involved in leading groups and things, one of the the key aspect of being a, a small group leader is to quieten the noisy ones and to draw out the quieter ones. Um, it is to engender meekness in the group dynamic. We're called to that as part of our divinity. And then the last word that Paul uses here is patience. And patience, of course, as you and I know and often struggle with, and as part of being, being part of our, our Advent journey, is all about waiting. And often it is waiting for others. And that can be so difficult. Uh, it's one of the things I hugely struggle with. I can sit in a meeting, I can sit in whatever, and I can very often see this is the way forward. We should just be doing this. And the temptation I have is before others have been given a voice or had an opportunity to voice their perspective, their understanding, their outlook, I want to step in. I'm impatient. Um, the joy I'm discovering as I, as I grow a little older and hopefully a little bit more mature and hopefully a little bit more aware is that when I quieten my voice, when I create that space for others to speak, as I take time to listen, as I am patient, so the conversation, the journey together draws out so much more than what I think. At the end of the day, I'm probably quite convinced that I'm right. Um, and that if I'd said this, we could, have, we could have just shortened the meeting by a whole couple of hours. Um, but actually, I may be right. But that conversation has expanded my perspective dramatically. And it has also meant because others have been given voice through my patience, that there is a, a common commitment to moving forward. It's not just hopefully Mark's idea. It is something that is our idea. And so these, these five or six words are, are I think, really, um, really quite significant. Um, Paul saying this is part of what it is to be or to represent or to, to share the divinity of God in our world. And you and I as people of faith are called to that. And so... On the Sunday after Easter, as we begin after Easter, after Christmas, as we begin to look forward to the new year and all that 2022 will hold, um, I really encourage us to find ways to to really reflect on um, on on what it is to be chosen, to be favoured by God, to be beloved, to be be loved deeply by God, 
um, and to seek the holiness of God to be reflected in and through us. And I would encourage you going forward, let's take time to reflect on what compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience actually looks like in our lives, uh, to be conscious and awake to, to living this and to making a difference in the world in which we live. Amen. And together now, we affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we continue now in prayer. We thank you for this gathering here today, your people in our community who have chosen to join and participate in this time of worship, joining in the prayer and teaching. And as we pray, we remember the life of Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, who died this morning. We remember him as a lively and outspoken man. We spoke truth to those in power. Inspire us to speak and live truth in this age of increasingly alternative facts. We remember his infectious laugh and his ability to find and celebrate joy in the simple things. Inspire us to find joy, regardless of circumstances, and to take time to recognize and celebrate simple moments and pleasures. We remember his amazing ability to remember people's names and stories. Inspire us to see and value people, to pause and listen to the story of those we meet and those around us. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray today for our planet during these hot summer months. We pray for those regions living in fear of fires. Help our leaders and each of us to take decisive actions to address climate change in our own city and over all the earth. Restore your creation, Lord, to balance and equity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the earth. And we continue to pray for those affected by this pandemic. Inspire those who've been hard at work for two years in the front lines. Grant them your presence and peace during these continuing waves. We pray for the nations of the world as they address divisions within their own countries. We pray that members of the human race may focus on what we have in common, that most people wish to live in safety and be able to provide for their families, have better lives and opportunities than they have had. Restore our nations to equity and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our own struggling beloved country. 
We pray for the continued recovery of our, of our president and all those who've been infected and affected by this fourth and earlier waves of COVID. COVID has shown us the gap between the rich and poor in our nation. Rule in the hearts of all who make South Africa their home, that we may live up to the potential that we have by pulling in the same direction. Restore our nation, O oh Lord. Help us to be the rainbow nation that Archbishop Tutu saw in us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our church and our community. We raise up those who are struggling within our own neighborhoods. We pray for the sick within our parish as they're listed in our pew leaflet and known within our, our hearts. We give thanks for those who are recovering from illness, surgery, and we pause now and remember those who are newly ill or for whom recovery seems a long way off or just too slow. We thank you for the chance to gather in our various formats over the last few days. As we move to new formats in the new year, we celebrate this connection that we have maintained. Restore relationships that we, we may have lost over these two years. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our friends, our families, those in our hearts, the people who know us best. We pray for all who suffer or are troubled. Lord, grant them the help they need and good friends to comfort them. Help all to hold fast to faith in difficult times. And we celebrate together the birthdays, the anniversaries, the happy times with family over this, this weekend. The pandemic and its effects on the movement of people and social distancing continues to make connection difficult. It's so important. Restore those who are broken and distanced at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, God, our sustainer, we pray for ourselves. You know us each so well. Strengthen and renew us. Rule in our hearts that we may finish this year and start the next, restored by you and not reliant on our own resolutions. Help us to break with the routine, the same old, and guide us to live as those who have true hope, those who step forward in faith, those restored by you. We, your people, offer these prayers. Amen. We move now to sharing in the peace together. And uh, we remind ourselves that our Saviour Christ is the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And so may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Peace be with you. We turn now to the great thanksgiving to our fourth Eucharistic prayer. If you have bread and wine, I invite you to hold them up as we give thanks for these gifts. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us, it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Redeemer. He is your living word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and he shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. 
in fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs, our sorrows, and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of the evil one and banish the darkness of sin and death. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your eternal presence. So now with all of creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I invite you to hold up the bread. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who on the night that he was handed over to suffering and death took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. We hold up the wine. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. And so together we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and to serve you. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church, gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. For all glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so the bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. The risen Christ is present with us in the sacrament. In a moment of silence, let us worship and adore him. And so we pray together. We come to this table not because we must, but because we may. Not because we are strong, but because we need strength. We come because we love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. We come because he loves us and gave himself for all. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so as we partake of the bread, either on our own or with those gathered with us, we say, the body of Christ given for us. And as we share the wine, we say, the blood of Christ shed for us.
And so let us give thanks for the Lord is truly gracious. God's mercy endures forever. We say together. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for keeping us by your grace in the body of your Son, the company of all faithful people. Help us to preserve as living members of that holy fellowship and to grow in love and obedience according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray for our nation and our continent in these uncertain times. God bless Africa, protect our children, guide our leaders, heal our communities, restore our dig dignity, and give us peace. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. And we offer ourselves in service. God Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. In the power of the Holy Spirit, enable us to live to your praise and glory. Amen. Christ, the light of righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, source of all being, eternal Son and Holy Spirit, be with you all and those for whom you love and care, now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you all so much for uh, being part of our worship this morning. Um, the faithful remnant do appreciate your presence. And I uh, do just wish you all, uh, for those of you who I may not have been in contact with over, the, over, over Christmas, a very blessed Christmas um, for, for this weekend. And of course, a very blessed Christmas. A very blessed and happy new year going forward. Uh, my hope is, as I said in my midnight sermon, that um, Christmas, this Christmas kind of shows the birth pangs and we will be ejected into reality and newness in 2022. Um, I'm sure 2022 will continue to have many of the frustrations we've experienced in the last while, but um, my prayer is that we will find an ever increasing sense of, of freedom and be able to come out of the sort of isolation that the pandemic has, has forced many of us into. So that is my prayer for us and for you as we move forward. So a very, very blessed new year. Um, having said that, I'm going on leave and as uh, someone said at eight o'clock again, um, and uh, yes, it is again, just another 10 days, uh, spending some time in Sedgefield over new year, uh, and then a few days in Stellenbosch. So I won't be with you next Sunday, but I will be back for Sunday the 9th uh, and look forward to re-engaging uh, at that time. But for those who may be traveling, um, time with family, et cetera, over the next while, uh, may, may that be blessed. And if you're struggling because COVID has uh, negated that ability to interact uh, physically with family, uh, do pray that over, um, over Zoom and WhatsApp and other things that those relationships may be renewed and celebrated. Thank you. Um, oh, finally, just to say, we do have some birthdays, which in fact, I think we, we mentioned all of them last Sunday, um, but maybe just to remind ourselves, Sarah Tuff uh, tomorrow, uh, Pam Bester, who's now moved to Johannesburg, but has been part of this congregation for many years, uh, celebrates, I think it's her 91st on the 28th, uh, so please keep her in prayer, uh, Claire Nell on the 29th, and then, of course, Freya, who's uh, been our our lay minister this morning, Freya, a very happy birthday for the 30th, and may that be a wonderful celebration. Thank you. Um, and then Tim Hacker on the 31st, and uh, three anniversaries this week, uh, Bruce and John Kuma on the 29th, um, and David and Elaine Sykes, and John and Leslie Burton on the 30th. Uh, I do remember last Sunday, uh, Leslie and John saying they were on 49 years this year, and um, David declining to indicate how many years they had been married, uh, so possibly a little bit more than 49. Um, so I love to all who are celebrating um, a new year of, of life and to those who are celebrating a new year of relationship as well. On that note, uh, we're not going to go into breakout groups, but do encourage you to just put your